We're going to get into the Word tonight. I'm really excited about this Word. Of course, that's true almost every week, I have to say, because I pray and seek God for a fresh rhema word, something that will speak to us in our situation now. You know, and I always find it amazing that God can take a word and He can give it to us, and with all the different contexts that we all come from, and all everybody here tonight has got a different circumstance, maybe a different size family, maybe different kinds of issues, maybe different kinds of celebrations, maybe we have different kinds of places we live, maybe there's different kind of cars we drive, we may have different personalities, but for some amazing reason, God can bring a word from the Holy Spirit, and it will hit the target for everybody. How many can see that that's true? How many know that that happens? And so tonight, I want you guys to ask the Lord to let this word permeate your life and permeate your circumstance. The entrance of God's word brings light. And we need that to know our direction, to be inspired, to know the things that God wants us to know and to embrace the thing God wants us to embrace. So I'm calling the message tonight Alive to Thrive. Alive to Thrive. And I'm going to go to the 13th chapter of Acts tonight. And we're going to delve in, dive into the Word. I like to use those swimming terms. We're going to dive into the Word and go deep in the Lord and believe God together. I'm going to read tonight from the King James Version of the Bible. And um, I want to start in the first verse. Just read four verses uh, here in Acts 13. Alive to thrive. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menon, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, how many know God speaks today? How many know God still speaks? This Bible verse says the Lord, the Holy Spirit, spoke to them. He said something. I think sometimes we have a dynamic in our lives where two things happen. God speaks, but we sometimes don't listen. But if you don't recognize that God is capable, willing, and will speak to you, you'll probably miss it. Phew. I mean, you know what a flyby is, right? When he does speak. But Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And so you got to get in close to the shepherd, in close to God. And I want you tonight to expect, as I said earlier, that God's going to speak to you. There's a voice that will speak sometimes from behind us and say, this is the way, walk ye in it. There, there are voices that, that, that God brings through his spirit that speak into our lives. And in this case, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit said, and he gave them instruction. And I love what he said. He said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, or dedicate to me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away, so they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, departed. Wow. Now, why would I call the message alive to thrive? Because God is interested in the church. God is interested in this organism called the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. And he wants that church to not be a dead church. Did anybody besides me come from the first church of the Frigidaire? How many came from that church, right? I, I was in a church where they had the trappings of religion, and they went through certain ordinances, and they did certain things, and they had the call to worship and certain prayers that we prayed, and all those things took place, but it wasn't alive. You recognize it's possible to have a body that looks per Matter of fact, some of the most neat Properly groomed people I've ever seen have been in caskets. Have you ever noticed that? And they even get the lighting just right. They have the little pink lights they shoot on them. And it, but, but, but having everything in place and have everything exactly right and making it look as good as possible doesn't make that church alive. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is filled with the Holy Spirit, and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is alive, and the church ought to be thriving because we ought to be in contact with the life of God through the Holy Spirit. Can somebody please say amen tonight? 
And so I'm here to challenge you guys that we will never settle for less than thriving in faith. And I think if you want to look into this topic, this is a case study in Antioch. They were first called Christians in Antioch. Antioch was an interesting place. Lots of history. And here we see a church that's fully functioning in every way. There are signs in these verses that I read that show us that God is working through this church. I pray for this fellowship and for churches around the world that we'll get a hold of God's vision for what it means to be alive in Jesus, alive as the body of Christ, alive as followers of the Lord Jesus. Come on, somebody. Are you, are you catching what I'm saying? And it's a big deal. The church is a big deal. Here's what it says. Listen to this. In Ephesians 5.25, you won't see it on the screen, but please listen. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Some people call the church the blood-bought bride. We're the bride of Christ. And that's an analogy. And it's blood-bought, pardon me, because he died on the cross and spilled his blood to purchase our salvation, to wash away all of our blood guiltiness. He's the one who put that sacrifice out there. He's the one that laid down and gave up his life. He's the one that hung on the cross and said, it is finished. He's the one that said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's the one that said to the one thief on his one side, today you'll be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. Come on, is anybody hearing what I'm saying? So Jesus, this is, the church is a big deal to Jesus. It's such a big deal that when he was ready to go to heaven, when he ascended into heaven, hallelujah, he gave them instruction. And what did he say? I want you to go and I want you to tarry that means to hold on and wait patiently in Jerusalem. And I'm going to send you the promise of the Father. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's going to give birth to a church. The Greek word means ekklesia. That's the Greek word, ekklesia. And that means church, or that's translated church. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I want you to get this in your mind. Say, Randy, why would you talk about the church? Well, for one thing, I'm a pastor. Did you notice that? I don't know if you noticed that. But beyond that, the church is the vehicle. It's the agency where God moves to reach into all strata of society all around the world into every nation. We are his hands. We are his feet. That's what the church is all about. Can you see that Jesus was willing to give, sacrifice his life for the church? He loved the church and gave himself for it, Paul wrote to the Ephesians. And so here in this passage, we see some keys to a thriving church. When I see a thriving church, I see a church where people are getting filled with the joy of the Lord, getting filled with the knowledge of God. I see a church where people can come and receive Christ, and somebody there will know how to usher them into the presence of God and bring that birthing process to fruition. I'm believing that Exalt Church is one of those churches, one of many that God has around the world, and that we're all unified by one spirit into one body, into one great ecclesia, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm thrilled to be a part of the church. I used to play in clubs whenever I was a young man. You know, I had a band. We played in bars and clubs and places like that. And you get people in there, and they'd be drinking, and they'd be, quote, unquote, having a good time. We'd go in and play music, and most of the time nobody was paying any attention. If you could keep them awake long enough, because they were drinking so much, they couldn't keep focused or sober enough to take on what was going on. I like the church because when we do a praise song, everybody's wide awake, and if you're drunk at all, it's drunk on the new wine, drunk on the Holy Ghost, and that's fine. How many know I'm telling the truth? But I like hanging out with people who are Christians. But you know what? Jesus went beyond that. Yes, he did. He hung out with believers. He said, follow me. He had an entourage. But he also hang out with prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners. People who had not yet come to a realization of his forgiveness. He hung out with them to a certain degree. The good news was he changed them. They didn't change him. And if you're going to hang out with people like that, you need to make sure that dynamic is at work in your life so that you're changing them through the power of God's word, the promises, the kingdom, and the Holy Spirit's great anointing, and they're not changing you. Is anybody hearing me tonight? And so this is what we see in a great church. But you're going to see a number of keys right here in these verses that God just made them shine to me. I'm so excited about them because I love what they say about the church. 
Let's look at them, just a few of them together. Here we go. First one is, a great church, a thriving church, celebrates diversity. It's not all one color. It's not all Johnny One Note. Not everybody has the same personality. Not everybody's from the same neighborhood. Come on, somebody get excited. I love diversity. How many know there's more than one color in the rainbow? And God made that rainbow. It doesn't belong to any social movement. No, 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 no. It belongs to God. He's the one who invented the rainbow. And one of the things I learned from the rainbow, variety is beautiful. One of the things I learned from the rainbow is that God speaks in different ways and beautiful tones through his people, and they're not all the same. We don't have to be cookie cutters to serve the Lord. We don't have to, you know, measure up to some kind of committee to see if we can join that church, like as if it's a country club. No, no, no. The church of Jesus Christ says all who may come on in, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The church says, I don't care what side of the tracks you're from or if you're in the middle of the tracks, you belong here. Come on in and hang out with us. And so we see that in the first verse. Look at the diversity of these group of people. The first one is Barnabas. He's called in the scriptures the son of consolation. He's been called the great encourager. He was a generous man. In Acts 4, he said, it said he sold a field and brought the funds to the apostles. The church is filled with generous people. The people in the church want to see the kingdom of God advanced. The people in the church want to see souls reached, and anything that needs to be done in order to make that happen, they're on board with that. That's what a great, thriving church does. And so Barnabas was an encourager, and he was generous. And when Paul came in, everybody was scared of Paul. I mean, everybody was shook up. How many remember Paul was terrorizing the church? Does anybody remember that at all? The church, the church was in fear because he was going everywhere with light letters from the Sanhedrin to put them in prison and even put them to death. He was persecuting the church, but he wasn't really persecuting the church because when he got knocked down on the road to Damascus and the bright light shined, it was a voice that said to him, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. So anybody picks a fight with you is picking a fight with your elder brother, Jesus. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? And so don't get nervous because he understands all this stuff. He's got a black belt and spiritual power. He can make things happen for you. He can move mountains. And so it says, uh, if you look into it, that, that Barnabas was a Jew, and he was from Cyprus, which is an island in the Mediterranean. So here's a man from an island out in the middle of the sea. But the next guy that's mentioned, and I love this, his name is Simeon, and he's called Niger. One translation said he's called the black man. He's called the black man. Now, that's not the N-word. That's a permutation of a language where Niger means black. And so the black man, and I, 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 there's no country of origin we see here. We don't know where Simon came from, I, I, Simeon came from. I mean, I've been in churches where some people show up. I have no idea where they came from. How many have been around some people you thought maybe they came from another planet? How many know that? How many know men in black, right? Men in black, where'd they come from? But that's all right, because God calls us from every place. God's not afraid of diversity, nor should the church be afraid of diversity. Some of the greatest churches I've ever ministered in were filled with people from all kinds of nations. I played in Englewood, New Jersey one time, did a little preaching, and did a concert there. And there was 160 different nations represented in that one church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You go into these big metropolitan areas like Toronto where I played New Year's Eve, and there must have been 50 or 60 different nations represented in that congregation because you know what? God's not afraid of diversity. He's got the whole world in his hands. It's his, and every person from every nation is hearing the voice of the Lord today. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm getting excited right now. I'm feeling an anointing because we are going to be a church that grows into a multicultural kind of a thing. I think we're going to have to have some Spanish translation for some people that's going to happen. Maybe the translation will happen by the Holy Ghost, or maybe we'll get somebody to translate. But I know that we can bring the nations together, and there's nothing like the unity that comes from walking with Jesus. So I love John Gill's commentary. Here's what he says about Simeon. By his first name, he appears to be a Jew, who by the Romans was called Niger, very likely from the blackness of his complexion. 
We got race problems in the United States of America. We got all kind of phobias floating around. If you, just, if you, if you say almost anything, they'll tell you you're a phobic person. And we got all those problems, and we've got those wedges, and we've got those disagreements, and we've got those misunderstandings. But you know what? The solution to all that is that everybody just get in Jesus. Everybody just get forgiven. Everybody get filled with joy. Everybody get filled with the same spirit. It doesn't matter what kind of pigment you got in your body. It doesn't matter what. You could have green blood or you could be Vulcan. I don't know. But you, you know, how many are hearing what I'm saying? God says, come in, all who are labored, everybody who's heavy laden, come on in. We're not going to check you at the door and find out what country you're from or what your background is. I love it when some of these people who are Muslims get saved and come to Jesus. They're some of the most fervent people you ever find in faith for the Lord. And don't you, don't you uh, miss this point. There are many, many people, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, Shinto, Muslims, all these different people. They're hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit in these last days. They're hearing a call and they're responding to the call. Is anybody besides me excited about this? And so it says here, the, his complexion, the blackness of his complexion, they caused him to call, call him the black man. And I love black people, man. I'm totally into it. I mean, let's face it. My hero when I was growing up was James Brown. Come on, hit me band. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And then I always like to listen to the Supremes. My girl, my girl, my girl. Come on, how many are there? The four tops. Right? Come on. You know what I'm talking about. I love those guys. I love the temptations. You know, Papa was a rolling stone. I don't remember how it goes, but I love that song. I mean, I just like that kind of music. I like soul music. I like a little black influence. You start getting a gospel groove going, man, and I practically leave the planet and go to heaven. I love that. And I love the different cultures. I love curry. It's also good for your brain. Come on, somebody. I love Spanish food. I love all this stuff. I like the diversity in the world. I don't like Johnny One Note. I like lots of different kind of music. I don't want to have just one kind of music in the church service. How boring is that? I like to change it up a little bit. Sometimes we'll throw something neoclassical at you. Sometimes we'll do some rocking thing. We get Josiah and, and Micah DeBicro up here, and they start cranking out some fuzz. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? We start making a joyful noise to the Lord. I don't know if, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm having fun right now. Because I love the church. I love the diversity. I love the different cultures. And so Simeon was one of those representatives. There's no surprise in this. Revelation 5.9 says this, Jesus Watch this, redeemed us to God by his, your blood out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. There are people coming to Jesus all around the world from every conceivable background. Amen. And I'm excited about it. I don't know if you can tell. I, I'm, I shout a lot, but I'm shouting more than normal tonight. And you know what? I'm proud of it. I'm just committed to making that noise tonight, that joyful noise. I'm feeling it tonight. The third person is Lucius from Cyrene, which is in Libya, North Africa. At that time, 300 B.C., before that time, there was 100,000 Jews that ended up there that had been chewed away under persecution. And it was an early center for Christianity. Libya right now has a lot of crazy stuff going on. Libya has a lot of terrorism going on. There's a lot of oppression of Christians there. But I'm believing God's going to liberate his people in North Africa. I'm believing God that's going to use the church in the United States to reach out to these different places and make a difference in the name of Jesus. Manayan was the next guy that's mentioned. And listen to this guy. Listen, look at the diversity. This guy was a companion, a childhood companion of King Herod Antipas. That's the man that was responsible for John the Baptist being beheaded. But it's obvious he came from rarefied company. Herod Antipas was a very, very select person. He was high up in the social hierarchy. He was from the upper echelons of society. And here's Maniah, and he's there, Manani, pardon me, and he's there, he's spending time with Herod Agrippa. He's the childhood companion to wealth and to privilege but he's hanging out with all these other people, and they came from all kinds of different backgrounds. I love the church. You know why? Because a multimillionaire can come in and sit down beside a little old widow woman, and when Jesus looks out there, he sees, he sees both of them as blessed. He pours out his blessing on both of them. He pours out his spirit on both of them. We don't have special seats here for higher-income people. 
What you see is what you get. We love you, and we hope you'll tithe, praise God. But, but we, we, just want you to, we just want you to come in and know that you're loved. And it goes for anybody, no matter what their background. We're not here to differentiate or have special sections for certain people. That's not what it's about. It's about the fact that Jesus loves all of us. And this guy had obviously social position, and yet he ended up following Jesus, change and transform. The final one is Saul. We all know about Saul. He was a Pharisee. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, he said. He came from a very religious background. Basically, Paul was a religious yuppie. How many know what a yuppie is? A young urban professional. Now, that's from back in the 70s or sometime like that. That was a term that was applied to people who were youngish, upwardly mobile, had good jobs, and had professional leanings in terms of what they pursued. And that's kind of what Paul was. He was, he was on the fast track in the Jewish faith. And here he is, hanging out with all these crazy Jesus freaks. Come on, are you out there? That's what you're doing tonight. Did you notice? And you should be glad. You're hanging around with good people tonight. You're hanging around with people that love God. You're hanging around with people that have got promises in their heart and power in their life and trust in their, in their soul. And so here's what I'm going to say. All those guys are men. There's not a woman mentioned, but women are not forgotten. The diversity extends to the genders, male and female. I remember Philip had four prophetess daughters. They prophesied. I remember that Anna came into the temple and prophesied that Jesus was the Messiah. I remember a couple of people named Aquila and Priscilla. Can you tell which one was the female? Priscilla. And she ministered right along with her husband and ministered into people's lives. So we just don't happen to have women mentioned here. But how many know that in the New Testament, women were given a place of honor and respect and blessing. And God used women over and over again. You know, women in the Jewish economy were not allowed to be witnesses in court. They were marginalized. They weren't allowed to have property. There are a lot of things that they were limited on. Women are still being oppressed in parts of the world today. And the church will not stand for it in the name of Jesus. But I remember when Jesus was about ready to raise from the dead, he, 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 he organized things in such a way through the Holy Ghost that the first people who witnessed his resurrection and reported that fact were not men, but women. If they went into court of law, they couldn't have witnessed that they had seen that Jesus, that Jesus had risen. But who did Jesus rely on to give that report? Women have a special place in the heart of God, and that's part of the diversity of the church. We don't gather together, and the men all sit in here, and the women sit out there like happens in a lot of Muslim countries and other religions. Where's only men allowed into the sanctuary? No. The door is open. We love y'all, and that diversity is important. God uses diversity to bless the world, and Jesus is the unifying factor. Jesus is the unifying factor. Say amen. And I want you to show, show some, something else about a thriving church. It always includes worship, prayer, and even fasting as a regular aspect of lives. Let me say that again. A thriving church includes worship, prayer, and even fasting as a regular aspect of their lives. And I love the second verse. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. But you notice they were ministering to the Lord. You see that word? They were ministering to the Lord. Notice it wasn't necessarily to one another, although that happens as a spillover. How many understand you've got to have your focus on honoring God, pleasing God, ministering before the Lord, and then it spills over to other people. They get the overflow. Are you out there tonight? Yes, and so what do we see here? We see that word minister, 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 which means basically a servant. The Greek word is latorgeo. Latorgeo means to discharge. Listen to this. A public office at one's own cost. That's what the Greek word means. To discharge a public office at one's own cost. The root means that you're serving the king. That's what the root word means in the Greek. What does that say to us? That says that when you serve the Lord, there's a certain amount of sacrifice you bring along with it. 
It, it, it comes out of your own heart. It comes out of your own commitment. It comes out of your own sweat and blood sometimes. But you know what? I found out that God awards sweat and blood. He rewards it. He rewards those who are willing to step out and be strong in their leadership, be strong in serving the king. And God will say to you, you are blessed because you're a minister of the gospel. Notice, too, that the word liturgeo, it also means everything from worshiping with a song. Now watch this. Please listen. To, I'm teaching you something powerful. To serving with your skills. Some people say, well, I don't sing very good, and I, I'm not really that kind of person. I'm not outward with my praise. You know, some people, some people dance, and some people move, and that's good if you can get loosened up, you know, get that whole thing going on because God loves that cheerfulness, and he loves that joy to minister to you. But not everybody's built that way. I'm not trying to make everybody into my mold. Remember, I talked about diversity. Are you out there tonight? But I am saying that God wants to use you in whatever capacity and whatever gifts he's given you. And that word, that word, letorgeo, geo, that includes concepts like things that you can create or things that you can do, or maybe you're a great organizer, or maybe you're a good person in terms of pulling together technical stuff, or maybe you can do this or do that. What I'm saying to you is that all of those things are ministering to the Lord. I don't care if you're sweeping the floor in here or you're, you're somebody up here leading worship. You're on the same level of, of serving to God. It all matters to Jesus. And you're blessed because you're ministering to the Lord. I want you to notice that's what they were doing. We ought to be doing that. And another thing we learn is prayer is indispensable. Listen to what John Wesley said about prayer. God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. Billy Graham said this, the Christian life is not a constant high. Billy Graham said, I have my moments of deep discouragement. I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, oh, God, forgive me or help me. This is Billy Graham speaking. But listen to what Jesus said. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. And I like what the New Living Translation puts that as. Men ought always to pray and never, never give up. Keep it up. Stay with it. Pray and keep on praying. Knock and keep on knocking. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. And also we have fasting is an important part of this. We just had a series of four or five weeks, I forget how long, that we fasted one time, one day each week. And we were crying out to God for some answers. And God's provided God's moved. God's done wonderful things. The reports are there. The testimony is real. And so all these things cause us to thrive in the Holy Spirit. But a thriving church also, and get this point, understands the importance of community. A thriving church understands the importance of community. Notice unity is a part of the word community. And you can uh, get unity a lot of different ways, but the one that really matters the most is when God unifies us. Say amen, somebody. Now let me just talk to you a little bit about this. I want you to get this. This is important. Look at these verses on the, scr on the screen for me. Can we put those up? I want you to look at these verses. I've got some of it underlined. Hopefully it's up that, that way. Verses 2 through 4. Okay, they're not underlined, but let's look at them. As they, everybody say they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, or pardon me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Everybody say them. Yes. Next verse. And when they, there it is again, had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them. See all the TH words? They sent them away. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Well, I guess I just read that one. Oh, wow. It's an echo. Okay, so we want to get that one straight. Give me that next verse, please. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed. you see all those TH words? Do you see that? Supernatural, prophetic, powerful things rise from the they. There's something about when we join our hearts together that moves God's hand. Let me give you an example of that. Everybody remember the day of Pentecost? Acts 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, 
they were all with one accord in one place. It's about sometimes us joining hearts together, joining faith together, joining prayers together. Look at Acts 4.31. Listen to this. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. It's not just up to the preacher. It's not just up to some designated evangelist to speak the word with boldness. It's about all of us being energized, all of us being commissioned, all of us being motivated. It's about all of us stepping up, and sometimes in a unified way. It's so beautiful to see the church singing together, worshiping together, speaking the truth together, making God's glory known together. Oh, wow. God works through the they. Please say that with me. God works through the they. Listen to this. Jesus sent them out. Two by two. What else did he say? Where two or three gather in my name, I will be smack dab in the middle of it. Do you see that they concept? It's them, it's they together. He also said if two agree, if two agree, it shall be done by God. There's something about that. And you know what I think it is? That concept, that principle, uh, illuminates and illustrates the Godhead for us. Because when God talked about making human beings, he said, let us, let us, let us make man in our image. We serve one God who is triune. The Lord our God is one God, but he's revealed in three distinct persons. I can't explain to you how all this stuff works. I just know that it works. And you'll notice that they agreed together. John says the three agree, that, 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 that there's, a, there's, a, there's an agreement there that brings about a flow of power and miracles and answers. Is everybody catching this? Are you getting what I'm saying? There's something about that. It reflects the nature of God. So when God sent them together to become the church, it wasn't just one guy. It wasn't even two. It was 120 in the upper room. And there was diversity in the upper room. The women were in the upper room, and they were filled and unified out of that diversity by one unifying power, which was the Holy Spirit of God. Has anybody here received the Holy Spirit in your life and the power and mobilization that he can give you? Oh, hallelujah. I'm feeling this tonight. I think this is an important word for the world. I think it's an important word for us. I think it's an important word that we get in our hearts that the person sitting right right down the road from you is not the enemy. The person right down the road from you is a brother or a sister in Christ and that God wants us to have one heart, one destiny, one faith, and one sense of, of calling so that we can rise up together, that we can give the devil flight, that we can see miracles, that we together can see people coming out of tough situations and being redeemed and saved through the blessed name of Jesus Christ. Stay with me. I'm, I'm, I'm coming down now for a landing, but I want to see how many have followed this so far. A thriving church is all about diversity. A thriving church includes worship, prayer, fasting. It moves God. A thriving church understands the importance of community. You see, when you start talking about community, the thing that I think about is the body of Christ. The scriptures teach us that the, that the church is a body. I use that word ecclesia. It means to be called out of your homes to gather in a public location. That's why one of the next steps we're going to make is to try to get our church facility out where it's more visible because we want to impact the community. We want people to see what's going on. Recognize there's a place they can come for prayer or encouragement. There's a place that they can come and hang out with people who really will love them, no matter what their background or their problems. We want that because we know that that's what we've been called to do. And the body of Christ gathers together publicly to make known the glory of God. As a matter of fact, Ecclesia includes the idea we come together in a public location for a declaration, which is what we're doing right now. I happen to have that job tonight. Pastor Sean's going to be ministering next week. And we hear from different people in different settings in our ministry. And all I'm telling you is that that's what the body of Christ is about. But what we learn from Paul about the body of Christ is the body's not just earlobes. 
How many are glad your body's not just earlobes? That would frankly be really scary. And it's not just thumbs. It's not just left foot. It's not just your toes. The body of Christ is made up of all different members, and they work together. You know, I'm a piano player, and I learned a long time ago, if I have my fingers but I don't have any ears, that's not going to work very well. If I have ears but I don't have any fingers, I'm not going to be able to make music. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? But it's got to be the body coordinating and working together that makes the music begin to flow. Every person is filled and called and needed in the body of Christ. Every person is needed. That means you guys. We've been in, in, uh, encouraging the go teams uh, here. We've got a bunch of people signed up. We've been sending out some emails and starting to get that organized. And part of that is to equip people, but also to set them free to start to minister in various areas to help the church thrive and to help us be servants so that when someone comes in, we can meet needs and we can see God's glory fall upon people everywhere. So the day of Pentecost is all about us being baptized into one spirit, into one body. And so I don't know what your thing is. I like to always claim the fingers because I am a musician. Maybe your thing is the eyes. Maybe you got the nose. Maybe you got the ears covered. I don't know what's up with you, but I know God's using you in the body some way or another. Please say amen. amen. And so please step into that by faith. Now, here's what I want to finish up by saying. A couple more things. A thriving church is other-centered. Other-centered. Outward, not inward. It's not about just having a little club where we keep blessing each other. It's not about just kind of comforting one another within this small clique. But the Bible shows us that in this circumstance, this church in Antioch was thriving. And part of the reason we know they were thriving is they sent them out. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed. There's something about that that's powerful. It's not just about getting filled up, filled up, filled up, filled up, filled up, and then never taking it out and sharing it with anybody. But what you have that God res uh, puts inside of you ultimately ought to come out and bless other people. Please say amen to that one. Yeah, that's what God's filling you up with. Joy, songs, encouragement, prayers, the word. Why? So you can pass it out. Give it to others. Be there as a resource for people. Oh, I hope you'll do this. I hope my prayer is that everybody here will see you, look in the mirror, and recognize you're an active, empowered, called member of the body of Christ. You're his hand extended. You're the feet that have the preparation of the gospel shot on those feet. You're the person that God has in mind to get some of these jobs done. What did he say? Look at that, those verses again. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Why? Because he said, separate the, these two guys out for the work I have for them to do. Now, I'm going to stop right here before I finish. I'm going to tell you a final story that I love to tell. But I want you to notice something. They sent them out for the work that they were assigned to do. We're living in a day and age where we need a lot of different people doing a lot of different things for the church to thrive. Matter of fact, Paul said if everybody were an ear, where would the body be? If everybody was a nose, where would the seeing be? If everybody would be eyes, where would the speaking be? But we all have diverse different kinds of giftings that God has planted in you. you got to be faithful to step up and let that shine. Develop it. Get it ready. We're equipping you in this church, trying to equip you to go out and do great things in the name of Jesus. And I see it happening. I'm thrilled that that's happening. But I want you to notice it comes out of community. It comes out of that kind of confidence. And so here we see them saying, go on out there and do the work that God's given you to do. Now, some people get all weirded out because you're not doing the job that I think you ought to be doing. See, I'm more spiritual than you. Because I'm doing this over here, but you're doing that over there. And I'm not so sure. I think everybody ought to be doing this over here. Because it's what I do. How many know that's spiritually egocentric? How many know that, right? 
But there are all different jobs. The work of the Spirit is very diverse. And God has different people with different gifts. The Bible calls it diverse giftings so that he can meet all the needs and the body can be complete and we can get out there and give the devil a migraine headache. Say amen, somebody. And so what am I saying to you? I'm saying you've got to get a hold of that vision. Get a hold of that calling. Get a hold of what God wants you to do. What's your job? Maybe it's on your, in your work to be a light, to be a, a person who's loving. Maybe it's the neighborhood thing. Maybe the neighborhood. Maybe some of the neighbors need somebody who will step up and give a little guidance or be there in a listening ear when they got a problem. Maybe it's going to be something that has a ministry connotation. Maybe it's going to be teaching a children's church class, or maybe it's going to be involved in missions. Maybe you're a giver. Maybe you're a person who's just got the gift of giving. Romans 12 mentions that. It says, do it generously, and do it liberally, and do it cheerfully. Be a person who will just step into your gifting and just go for it. And you know what I found? God will absolutely bless you. He will cause you to be so excited about the kingdom and so excited about your own life that you just won't be able to stand yourself. That's a quote from James Brown, by the way. Can't stand myself. Is anybody hearing me tonight? So other focused, outward. And I don't, look, I don't apologize that we get together and we encourage one another. We need that. There's times where you've got to be together. How many remember on the day of Pentecost? The day of Pentecost was preceded by about 10 days of just togetherness with one small group of 120 people in the upper room. There are times when we've got to get it together. I feel like Exalt Church has been getting it together, and I feel like we're doing okay with God's help. Hallelujah, and I'm happy about it. But now there's a time coming where the spark's going to hit. And we're going to start impacting lives, impacting lives, seeing people off of drugs, seeing people off of booze, getting people out of sexual uh, uh, perversions and, and all kind of addictions, getting people who find out their real destiny lies in Jesus, getting people who are struggling through life and don't know where to turn, and their kids are you know, having a rough time. This church represents the truth of God's kingdom and the help that I've gotten, and boy, have I gotten it. I want to share with other people. I want to see them helped and strengthened and strong and joyful and filled with peace and love. I want to see all of that. How many are with me? Is anybody with me on this? You want to see the people in your life, your relatives and friends, filled up with some kind of a purpose that matters and transcends the, 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 the passing fancies of this world? I'm here to tell you that God can do it. Now I'm going to tell you a story that illustrates what I'm talking about. Then I'm going to stop. And I've told this story down through the years uh, a number of times because I love it. I read two different biographies about this man, and I saw it in both biographies. And here was this um, young man who lived on a farm, and it was during the Great Depression. Of course, that ran from 29 to about 39. <clears throat> and in that particular southern town, there was a lot of angst and problems that people were involved in. I don't think we really relate to what the Great Depression was like in our nation. I think it's hard for us to get our head around it. I remember my mother saying when she was a kid that her father worked hard in all kinds of different jobs. And when it came time for Christmas morning rolled around, each one of her, her brothers and sisters, she being included, got one gift when they got up on Christmas morning. What was the gift? An orange. One orange. No, it wasn't a Fabergé orange. It was just a plain old orange. And it was one of the greatest thrills because they had nothing. People had to pray for food. They had to struggle to make it. They had to do anything they could to help their neighbors. It was a terrible time, a rough time. And so here we are seeing these guys, 30 Christian businessmen, that started getting together to pray in this southern town. And they got together outside normally. They would gather outside. And finally, they wanted, they said, we've got to have a day of prayer and fasting. They hadn't been, they'd been praying, but they wanted to fast. And said, we're going to ask this farmer down the road if he, we can use his farm. We're going to go down there, and we're going to spend the morning, afternoon, and into the evening, and we're going to cry out to God for our community. We're seeing people are giving up hope. We're seeing people who are thinking about suicide. We're seeing people that can't get enough to eat. There's problems all around. We know that God is the solution. 
So these Christian businessmen asked this farmer, he said, sure, come on over, I'll join you. So the day came, and they all arrived, each one with a handmade quilt. They put it down in the middle of the field, out in the middle of the farm. They knelt down on the quilt and began to cry out to God. And I'm talking about cry out to God. None of this mamby-pamby, I don't really mean it prayer life. They started bringing the fire. Come on, somebody say amen. And so they were crying out to God, and they were praying. And one of the farm workers was out in the other side of the farm, down over the hill, didn't know what was going on. The farm worker was down there, and he said to the son of the farmer, what's going on down there in the other side of the farm? There's all kind of shouting and noise. He said, oh, my dad invited a bunch of fanatics to come out here and pray today. He called them fanatics. So anyhow, the guy said, okay, well, let's get back to work. Finally, one of the guys stood up. His name was Vernon Patterson. He was one of these businessmen. And he, bull, he prayed a bold prayer. I mean, look, if you're praying for food for breakfast the next day, what I'm about to tell you is a bold prayer. He said, God, from this very city, Charlotte, North Carolina, raise up someone who will go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation. Well, they were startled. They've been praying for light bills, and they've been praying for the farms to hold up. They've been, here he's praying for the whole world. How many know God loves big prayers? How many know God loves big prayers? Come on, son. You better have a big prayer. God's looking for that in your heart. Well, little did he know that that farmer's son, you know the one who called him fanatics? His name was Billy Graham. And they had a revival meeting outside of Charlotte, North Carolina that he attended. And that night he gave his life to Christ. He was filled with the purposes of God. And everybody knows the rest of the story, right? Yes. He visited nations all around the world. Probably the greatest evangelist of the 20th century. With the message that Jesus loves people all around the world. That he died for them. But see, what I want you to notice is the businessmen were concerned about others. When you get other centered. That activates God. That activates your faith. When it's all about you, I don't think you're fulfilling the full destiny of what God's called you to do in the Spirit. God wants you to be interested in everybody around you, including the little lady across the street, the guys on the job, the people in your school. Are you praying for them? Are you interested in them? Are you praying for our nation? We got a crazy election going on right now, and there's no other word for it but crazy. C-R-A-Z-Y. So I'm just praying, God, somehow you can bring some kind of thing out of this. I'm just praying for our nation. Because it's about time the church realizes we wield the power. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves, call on the name of the Lord, turn from their wicked way, pray, seek my face, then I'll hear from heaven, and I'll come and heal the land. we got to realize we have the sword of the Spirit. We've got to realize that when we pray, things start shifting in the heavenlies. And I don't care what age you are. Don't tell me, oh, I'm only 17 or 16 years old. I can't make that much of a difference. Mary was most likely a teenager when she bore the Savior and brought him into the world. God, and he, God gives his covenant many times to teenagers to see it fulfilled. Is anybody hearing me? So don't let yourself off the hook tonight just because you're younger than me. Of course, practically everybody in here is younger than me, but don't, you don't let yourself off the hook on that one. Trust in God. Step up and be the next generation. Prod the old lions on a little bit. Give them a little jab. Have some fire in your soul. Recognize that you can reach out into the world and your prayers and your praise and your message and your life and the example that you bring to it can change circumstances, change people, and change families. Come on, give it up for Jesus, somebody. Come on tonight. Come on. Praise the Lord. So I want to just declare something tonight. We're going to take a few minutes tonight. And we're not going to rush it. We've got, we're not going to go back and fix food yet or anything like that. We're just going to, we're going to take a, a little bit of time right here just to pray. And I'm going to, I'm, I, I really, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up with me. We're going to pray. We're going to pray that we can be a thriving church. We're going to pray tonight that we can reach our community. We can change the circumstances for families and that we can literally reach all the way into the worlds, the four corners of the world. We're going to pray tonight for the drug addicts in Sarasota County, Manatee County. 
that are dying on the streets. We're going to pray tonight for the poor. And not only that, but we, we give and do what we can to help them. But we're going to do all these things in the spirit realm. Because that's where the business really gets done. And so I'm going to give you guys, I would really love it if I could get the young people, college age and down, to lead the way tonight and come up here around this altar to pray with me. If you're serious about Jesus, I want you to step out. If you're a young person, a teenager, or a college age, anybody like that, I want this generation to step forward first.